In the year 20XX in South Korea, it was an ordinary day, no different from any other. The peace that they thought would last forever shattered because of a dungeon that appeared out of nowhere. Countless monsters poured out, cornering humanity in fear. A lady who was running away tripped and, upon looking back, shook in fear when she saw a huge monster lifting a huge axe to kill her. But then, alongside despair, came hope in the form of entities called hunters. The resources that appear when killing the monsters made humanity prosper, and this was how the world of hunters began. Our protagonist was in the Hunter Association registration, but the lady assisting him mentioned it was her first time seeing a labor class while looking at his documents. Then, the lady calls our protagonist's name, Yujiha, to ask if he had acquired any skills or traits. He smiled and replied that he hadn't. Later, in Seoul Sector 7 Hunter store, customers walked inside, and Yujiha, the store owner, welcomed them warmly. A man mentioned they came to get some potions, but then a lady recognized him and asked if it was true that he was the one who had gotten the labor class, to which he replied yes. She asked again if it was true he didn't have any skills and how he managed to hunt. The man stopped the lady, then apologized to him, explaining that the lady with him didn't know how to read the room. He tells the man it was okay because she didn't say anything wrong. Then, he scans the potions the man wants to buy and explains that he doesn't have any special skill, so he doesn't hunt but just gathers resources at the back, making the lady awkwardly agree with him. The man asks the lady why she has to ask it and tells her to stop wasting time, but she just tells the man that there's nothing wrong with being curious. Suddenly, they heard a loud sound and, when they looked outside, they saw a vehicle rushing on the road. The lady tells the man that it seems like a rank 3 dungeon opened somewhere because they even brought panzers. The man agreed because he also saw some ambulances and tells the lady that he wants to try getting into a place like it too. The lady tells the man to wake up and that their skill is far from enough, making the man angry and tells the lady that the way she talks is starting to bother him without them realizing that he is listening to them from behind. After the customers finish shopping, he respectfully thanked them for coming. He knows that there would be a lot of resources in rank 3 dungeons, but he also knows that they won't contact him for it. It's been 5 years since Jia got awakened and got a unique class called Labor, but he didn't get any skills or traits, so he couldn't even dream of getting inside the dungeon with other hunters to kill the monsters, so he decided to be at the rear. After a company or a guild swiped a dungeon, he started picking up the leftovers and selling them. He knows that nobody recognizes his work, but it is good enough to support his hobby of reading old books. Then he starts reading the book until hours pass. He yawns in sleepiness and wonders if it was because the book he was reading is too hard to read. Then his eyes slowly closed, and he was down on the table to sleep. Suddenly, the book he was reading released a light that wrapped around him and teleported him to somewhere. Then, a moment later, the leaf fell on his forehead, making him wake up in shock and look around in panic. He stood up, wondering where he was. He pinched his face to test if he was dreaming, but when he felt the pain, he realized it was definitely not a dream, making him wonder if it was an illusion and if he would discover something by opening his status window. He opened his status window, and it showed that he was level 1. With health at 80 Etho, vitality at 70 Essence, endurance at 7, agility at 8, strength at 8, talent at 9, physical at 80, and poison at 80. His Etho, Essence, Element, and Abnormal status were none. He noticed nothing special about his status window, but when he looked around, he noticed the forest was a little weird because he didn't hear any animal sounds, and he couldn't see much because of the thick fog. All he could see were some twigs with fruit that looked like it had been hit by a storm. He bent down to look at the fruits because he hadn't seen any fruit like them before. Then, the system showed him that the fruits were called Eva Herb Level 1 and they made the Eva consumption of all skills zero for 10 seconds, making him wonder if the Eva Herb plant description was for real. He was amazed that it could reduce Eva consumption to zero for 10 seconds, knowing that hunters need Eva no matter what to use a skill, and it was somewhat like fuel, with the amount of Eva used depending on the strength of the skill. He looked at them, wishing he could extract some liquid from them, but he hadn't brought any bottles with him. Then he noticed something, a lively leaf on a tree that looked unnatural. He thought it might die if he just left it like that, so he decided to help a little. After grabbing some water, he poured it onto the small tree. Then he stood up, glad that there was water nearby, and hoped it was enough to keep the small tree alive. Suddenly, the system showed that he had obtained a plant-friendly level 1 skill, plant amiability, and he had obtained the blessing of XXX level 1. He couldn't believe he got a skill and trait when all he did was plant a twig, knowing that it had never happened to him in five years. Then the small tree lit up, and its roots consumed the huge tree behind it, making him unable to believe that the old tree was disappearing in front of him. Suddenly, he was back in the store in shock, and when he looked around, he realized he was back. He rubbed his eyes, thinking that all of it was just a dream, but then he felt something and realized there was dirt on his hands, making him confused and asking himself if it wasn't a dream. He also wondered if he unknowingly suffered from sleepwalking. 
but then he remembered there was no place with dirt around the store, making him wonder if he would be able to return to that forest again if he slept. Deciding to find out, he went to sleep and was sucked into the book once again. As he had expected, he woke up in the forest from earlier, but he noticed it had become wider and the fog had cleared a bit too. He thought it might be a dungeon he could enter by falling asleep, though he had never heard of such a thing. While he was examining the small tree he had helped, he was surprised to see that the tree behind it produced a solar apple level 1. When combined with a health potion, the healing amount increased by 20%, and its duration decreased to 80%. Knowing how rare solar apples were, even in high-ranked dungeons, and remembering that health potions were commonly used but in limited quantities with healing amounts about 10% of maximum health, he was amazed. The solar apple not only added 20% additional healing but also decreased the healing time. Looking up in amazement, he saw a swarm of solar apples in the trees around him. He knew that if he could take the solar apples and eat the herb liquid there, he'd be able to make a potion with incredible effects. He wondered if it would be fine to take one or two of them and if he could hide them in his clothes. Suddenly, a bag fell on his face hard, making him panically ask what it was. When he grabbed it, he saw it was a dimensional pouch. He wondered if he would be able to take items from that place to the general store. Inside the pouch, there were some vials. He laughed awkwardly, knowing he was just thinking about how to transport them, but he couldn't believe a pouch would suddenly fall from the sky, making him feel not only shocked but a bit scared. Still, he decided to see if he could take it because he had everything he needed. The next day, in the famous Hunter Specialty Chain Store in District 7 of Seoul, hunters were rushing inside. One of the hunters angrily asked the workers if there really were no more paralysis resistance potions left. The workers bowed and apologized, explaining they had run out of stock. They told the man that if he could wait just one hour, they would try to supply them. On the other hand, a lady was panicking because the product they needed was out of stock and ordered the man with her to contact other locations in a hurry because they needed to enter a dungeon in 30 minutes. The man told her that the other stores had none in the witch's cauldron too, so he would try contacting the pyramid. Suddenly, the man noticed someone approaching and saw it was Co Hyogen, the sword witch. Hyogen asked the workers if they could call the manager. The people inside the store became silent when they saw Hyogen, knowing she was 12th in the hunter ranking. Then the manager came out and couldn't believe she was there. He told her he had no idea she'd come to that place in person, and she responded that she came because he wasn't answering her calls. She then asked him if the potion they talked about yesterday was still there. The manager apologized to her and explained that they had a lot of bookings originally, so her potion was still being prepared and tried to tell her to wait a little bit. But she told him she couldn't do it because she must finish the preparation in 30 minutes and enter the dungeon. Then she opened her cell phone map to find a general store around there. Meanwhile, in Gia's store, he was busy mixing the liquid in the bottle and checked if he put the purified water, Undine's tears, and Aether herb liquid to make sure that there was nothing left behind. Then he put the mixture to the solar apple concentrate and mixed it a bit, then a strong light came out from the bottle. Then the system showed him that due to his XXX's blessing, a great success verdict has been applied, and because of it, he has acquired an alchemy skill level 1 and a special potion level 1 which makes all skill ether consumption becomes 0 for seconds and recovers percent of maximum health over 15 seconds. He couldn't believe he had alchemy skills, knowing that even self-proclaimed alchemists don't have alchemy skills. Also, he couldn't believe he made no ether consumption for 14 seconds and even health recovery. He shook the mixture he made, wondering what in the world is the XXX blessing that the effect got it good. Then he looks at the bottle wondering if it will be alright to sell it, and he doesn't know how much he should charge for it because the effects are a bit hard to believe, making him wonder who'd believe him if he said all ether skill consumption becomes zero for 14 seconds. So, he decided not to sell it and check it out for himself first. Then Hyogen walked inside his store, and he warmly welcomed her. He asked her how he could help her. She rushedly responded that she needed a potion and asked him if he had potions, then told him to rush because there is no time. Then she saw the special potion he made and asked him if it was a health potion. He replied that it was a health potion and was about to say something when Hyogen cut him by asking him what the potion's effects were. He told her that it was not for sale, but she just grabbed the potion while apologizing to him and explaining that there was no more time, so if there was nothing wrong, she'd take it. Then she put some money on the table and walked away while telling him that it should be enough money for it. But if it was not enough, he could contact her guild. He tried to call her, but she disappeared in an instant, leaving him stunned and asking himself if he was right that it should be fine. Then, a moment later, Hyogen walked into the dungeon and immediately attacked the monsters in front of her. Safely getting down, she speedily ran deeper into the dungeon, leaving the dead monsters in the back. Her team, tasked with collecting monsters' crystals, realized that rank 12 would indeed be different. One of them wondered if there was anything left for them to do. 
Another replied that it was nice and comfortable but questioned if it didn't feel quite right to him because they also needed to raise their skills. One man bent down and slashed the dead monster's body to retrieve the crystal, advising his companion not to bother the sword witch and to quietly gather the resources. After grabbing the crystals, he explained they should understand Hyogen. If it were the old Hyogen, she would have asked them to join in. But ever since that incident, she had changed to complete solo play. The other man, curious about that incident, was told he must not know because he was a newbie. Before the explanation could continue, Hyogen shouted at them to run. Initially puzzled by her sudden command, their confusion turned to fear when they saw what was in front of them, a manstalker. It was an aversion level monster, the size of an armored car and very dangerous due to its use of extreme poison. Trembling, one man questioned why an aversion level monster, typically found in grade 4 dungeons, appeared there. Hyogen ran toward the manstalker, shouting at them that she had told them to run away. Way. She then jumped and cast a swarm of magic circles to release a barrage of swords, gathering them together to form a huge sword to attack the Manstalker. However, the Manstalker blocked her attack with its claw and countered with its other claw, throwing her away. Shakily standing up, she realized it was too strong, that even her ether was almost consumed. It would only be enough to buy some time for the others to escape. She thought of Seung Hyuk, knowing she would be fine with him there, but since Seung Hyuk was not around, she could only rely on herself. Then, she drank the special potion with closed eyes, expecting it to taste bad. But to her surprise, it was delicious, like a beverage. She felt like she was overflowing with Etha. Confidently, she stared down the Manstalker, knowing with the help of the special potion, she could fight. She jumped at the Manstalker, about to attack her, and used her powerful sword Rampage, slashing the Manstalker a hundred times in just seconds. The Manstalker was chopped into pieces by her attack and fell to the ground defeated, while she couldn't believe she had done it. Then, she noticed that on top of health recovery, even Aether consumption was gone, and thanks to it, she could use the powerful sword Rampage for 10 seconds when she usually could only use it for 3 seconds. Guessing the effect was due to the special potion, she wondered what in the world that shop was. The next day, in Jia's store, someone opened the door, and to his surprise, it was Hyogen returning. She called out to him loudly, making him stutter a welcome but she immediately asked about the potion he had sold her. The hunters already in the store whispered among themselves, recognizing her as Hyogen and discussing how she had single-handedly dealt with a swarm of manstalkers, drawing her attention. She calmed down and apologized for being rude. He reassured her that he was okay and asked if there was a problem with the potion. She stated there was a problem because she had never seen a potion that could heal 14% of health points and cost no etha. He mentioned he had seen the post about her eliminating the aversion monster on her own but she corrected him angrily, stating it wasn't her but the potion he gave her. She then questioned where he got it or if he brewed it himself. He showed her the solar apple, explaining he had used it in the potion. When she asked what it was, he said it was a solar apple, then explained he had found it in a Tiro dungeon. She was skeptical and wondered if solar apples were that common. While he thought revealing the forest to Hyogen might not be wise, deciding instead to make up some excuses. He then expressed his happiness that his potion had helped her, but she shyly looked away and pointed to another potion, asking about it. He informed her it was an ice resistance potion. She inquired about its effects, and he estimated that it provided 32% ice resistance for 40 minutes, shocking her because she knew the best quality ice resistance potion on the market only offered 10% resistance for 15 minutes. Demanding to know where he found such ingredients, he became nervous. The truth was, it came from the forest, where he had harvested winter strawberry level 1, offering 20% ice resistance for 30 minutes. After mixing it well, he successfully created an ice resistance potion that increased his alchemy skill to level 2. He nervously claimed he found it in a tier O dungeon, but she knew he was lying, thinking to herself that he was a bad liar. She then stated she wouldn't pry further since he seemed uncomfortable but insisted on buying all of his stock. When he questioned if she truly meant all of them, she placed a large sum of money on the table, stating she didn't need a receipt and that the money was well beyond the potion's worth. He attempted to tell her the money was much more than necessary, noting she had overpaid last time too, but she simply walked away, telling him that the money wasn't enough for potions like those. Before she left, she asked for his name. Upon hearing it was Yu Jiha, she smiled, saying it was a nice name and that she would see him next time. A moment later, inside the forest, he looked at the glowstone and kindle gem he had obtained, pondering if he should find more winter strawberries, especially since Hyogen had taken all the ice resistance potions. He hadn't realized there were glowstones and kindle gems there and was amazed at the abundance of resources in the forest without any monsters, wondering about the true nature of this place. Suddenly, something moved behind him and made a noise, causing him to look back in surprise and ask what it was. He immediately looked around, knowing that he hadn't misheard and something was indeed there. 
Then, he found what it was, a pterodrone, a mythic monster. It was a small, car-sized monster resembling a beetle with giant claws. He knew about mythic monsters, but he noticed that these were kind of small and there was a wall. He put his hand on the wall, realizing he couldn't go past it, and wondered where the pterodrone was hurrying to. But then, he saw devil ants, a hazard monster. They were cargo truck-sized monsters, and killing one attracted ten more of them, making them difficult to eliminate. Then, he saw that the pterodrones were fighting the devil ants. He remembered reading something about devil ants in a book before. The book stated that devil ants are hazard monsters, but their poison makes them more dangerous than aversion monsters. While watching them fight, he realized something was off because the system stated that the devil ants and pterodrones were supposed to be cargo truck-sized monsters, yet here they were, smaller. Then, he saw the devil ants biting the pterodrones, noticing the pterodrones were losing, and wondered what they were fighting for. He panicked upon realizing that the pterodrones were going to lose and questioned if there was any way he could help them. Suddenly, the system showed him that the war between him and his pterodrones against the devil ants had begun and asked if he would like to help his legion, surprising him that he could intervene. He smiled, thinking the system strange for calling the pterodrone his, but he clicked yes because he decided to help them. The system then showed him that his legion was currently losing, but he could use his essence to cast an area buff. It gave him choices to pick from, with different costs of essence as a payment. He figured out that he couldn't help them directly, but he could provide assistance, then realized that he did have something that seemed like essence. He was glad that he happened to have two essences and chose the number, Laborer's Blessing, to help his legion. After paying for it, the pterodrones received the Laborer's Blessing, which made them stronger. They immediately flew toward the devil ants and easily cut them into pieces. Then, the pterodrones landed on the ground in complete victory. Amazed at their win, he shouted that they had gotten all the devil ants. He watched the pterodrones cheer on their victory, unable to believe what he had just witnessed and thought it was crazy. Then, he thanked the pterodrones for protecting the forest and was about to praise them for their good work, but he stopped when he saw the pterodrones giving him many essences and essence stones. He asked them if they were giving these to him. Then, he smiled and thanked them but told them that acquiring essence and essence stones was good enough for him, and told them that they deserved it more because they fought with their lives. Suddenly, the barrier wall slowly disappeared, making him surprised and he noticed that the fog was gone too. He grabbed the essence tightly, deciding that he was only going to stay for a bit today and plan not to return for a while now. After the appearance of the dungeon and the hunters, a community for hunters known as HunterNet was created. Currently, HunterNet is a buzz about Hunter Rank 12, Sword Witch CO Hyogen. The person with Codex 7 tells everyone that there should be no dispute about Hyogen soloing the Manstalker, while the person with Codex 92 replies that it's also undisputed that it was something Hyogen couldn't have done by herself. X92 tells X7 that she can't lie about the number of people entering the dungeon, and it's hard to believe that Hyogen hunted with someone. X7 replied that Hyogen had been a solo player ever since Han Sugyuk disappeared. X92 tells her that he honestly hopes Hyogen forgets about Sugyuk, as she can't miss Sugyuk forever. The lady with code X7 was angered and thought that the man only speaks like that because it wasn't his problem. Then, she replied that Hyogen's significant other disappeared in the dungeon, and she can miss Sugyuk as much as she wants. But X92 responded that it's been three years, and it has also been three years since Hyogen started going around the dungeon to find Sugyuk. She tried to reason, but X92 told her that they should stop talking about a person who went missing unless she was CO Hyogen herself, which made her furious because X92 crossed the line. Suddenly, the room light lit up, and Choi Cholhyun, an Eternal Flame Guild top alchemist, asked the lady if she was a zombie and told her that it wasn't good for her eyes. She replied that she could concentrate better when it was dark and asked him if he looked into what she asked him to do. He replied that he went in person, and it was the lowest rank hunter with no traits, Yu Jiha, but as he expected, he didn't feel anything special from Jia. The lady tells Cholhyun that it means Jia has nothing to do with Hyogen getting stronger, but then Cholhyun tells her that Jia is selling something special and asks her if she knows what a solar apple is. She asks him what a solar apple is, and he replies that it is an item that drastically reduces ether usage. Also, he had never seen it in person until then and explained to her that Jia brewed a potion out of it and was selling it as a potion for a very cheap price. She told him that if the apple was real, it couldn't be that cheap. He goes to the chair while telling her that they can assume two things from it. The first one is that Jia doesn't know the value of the solar apple. But he cuts him by saying that if it wasn't that, Jia is a person without any greed. Then she stood up and told him that she'd go see Jia herself since she needed some fresh air too. He asked her if he should get the car ready, but she replied no, telling him that it was too much because she was not like a CEO or anything. He told her that she might not be a CEO, but she was in a similar position because she was the Eternal Flame Guild Master, Cha Wa Young. Meanwhile, in the forest, he was sitting near the bonfire. 
He realized that it was closer to the deeper parts of the forest and was glad that he had brought a lighter with him. Then, he thought about how the wall and fog that blocked the inner forest had disappeared. He looked around, there wasn't a significant difference, but he didn't explore fully because he could feel that the darker part of the forest was too dangerous. He stood up, deciding to head back because he didn't want to put himself in danger, but then the pterodrones emerged from behind him, and he asked them if they were the same pterodrones from before. Then, he noticed they were holding mist chasing flower seeds, making him guess that it gets rid of fog. He asked the pterodrones if it was for him. Then, he noticed a new face among the pterodrones because it was bigger than any he had seen before and asked if it was the leader, as it seemed a little different from the rest. But then, he realized they came from the dark side of the forest, making him ask them if they had just come from that ominous place. Suddenly, a system interface popped up in front of him, showing that the pterodrone requested him to rescue their queen. He then asked if he would like to accept it. He guessed they have a queen like ants or bees and realized that those mischasing flower seeds were meant to ask him for help. He told them that he agreed because they protected the forest, so he would do what he could too. Then, he admitted to them that he was a little scared but still willing to help. He then petted one of the pterodrones' heads and told them that he should prepare, so they should do it tomorrow. The next day, he had prepared a healing potion, poison resistance potion, and combat ration. He then gave them to the pterodrones while he was busy thinking that if he added an area buff like last time, the devil ants should be easy to handle. After they were ready, he shouted to them that they should go and rescue the queen now, to which they followed him. A moment later, he arrived in a deeper part of the forest and, as he expected, the devil ant hive was the source of that ominous feeling he had felt. He couldn't believe that it was where the devil ants lived because it was at least three meters tall. Then the devil ants came out of their hive when the pterodrones flew toward them to attack. The system showed him that the war between the pterodrones and the devil ants had begun, and then he saw the two different monsters fighting each other seriously. He was amazed that the pterodrones were doing better than the last time but noticed they were still in danger. Then, the system showed him that for a limited one time, he could assist them with his power and put the devil ants with wings on the ground with a strong slap, but it needed three essences. He was surprised that he could help only once, and when he read how he should do it, he was astounded. He couldn't believe that he could only perform one slap in such a situation, making him wonder what he was supposed to do with it. But then, he noticed a bigger ant peeking out from the hive and realized it had wings, which meant it was the devil ant that acted as the messenger. Then, the system showed him that the devil ant army was trying to send a message, and they seemed to be trying to call the main army, making him surprised. He looked at his palm, knowing that he could stop them from sending a message with his slap. Then, he clenched his palm and decided not to think about it further. When the winged devil ant was about to fly away, a huge palm appeared above it and pressed it down to the ground. He looked at it and, smiling, told it that he got it. Meanwhile, Wei Yan arrives at Jia's store, wondering if this is the place, the general store that sells the solar apple. She notices that from the outside, the store looks just like an ordinary general store, but she doesn't know what kind of secrets lie within. She remembers that Hyogen had mentioned catching the Manstalker after visiting this place, so she decides to uncover the secret. However, when she tries to open the store door, it doesn't budge, leaving her confused and questioning if it's locked. She finds it strange because the sign on the door indicates that it's open, leading her to wonder if Jia is in the restroom. Then, she excuses herself to a man nearby and asks if the store is open today. The man replies that he's not sure and thinks they haven't been open since yesterday. He also mentions that he doesn't know if something is wrong, but the young man owning the shop hasn't opened it often these days, expressing disappointment and commenting that young people these days lack a professional mindset. She wonders why the store is often closed, especially since she had heard that they are only closed on weekends. Then, she looks at Jia's store logo and thinks that, as she expected, that general store and the guy called Jia must be hiding something. Meanwhile, back in the forest, he lifts his hand and looks at the dead winged devil ant, wondering if that should be enough. On the other hand, the devil ants are sweating in fear while looking at the pterodrones with newfound confidence. Then, the pterodrones fly toward the devil ants to attack again, but the devil ants run away crying. A moment later, he sighs, relieved that somehow he finished it safely, while the pterodrones cheer happily around him for their victory. He wonders if the pterodrones queen is still inside the ant nest, but then he hears something to his side and sees that the pterodrones have rescued their queen. The queen is severely injured. When she looks at him, she tries to stand up to thank him. He reaches out to her with his finger, telling her that it's fine and she doesn't have to overexert herself. Then, he pats the queen's head, relieved that she is fine. Suddenly, a system pop-up shows him that the Pterodrone Queen wishes to pledge allegiance to him, and if he signs a contract with the Pterodrone Corps, he will become a sponsor of the Pterodrone Corps and receive several items, but he will also have to grant their requests. He thinks there is no need to hesitate because it wasn't difficult, and they can help each other.
other out, so he agrees. Then, the system shows him that the Terra Drone Queen and its core have pledged their allegiance to him, meaning he will be able to sponsor the core more directly. Then, one of the Terra Drones floats in the air, and he realizes it is the Terra Drone General from before. Light wraps around it as it evolves, and he is amazed by the transformation. It becomes a Terra Drone warrior with huge claws and grows bigger, making him think that it certainly looks like a general now. Then he looked to his side when he heard a noise. When he looked, he saw they were bringing a lot of it again, even though he had told them he didn't need that much. After they placed the essence, he scratched his face in disbelief and looked at his hand to examine the seeds the Terra Drone General had given him. The seeds were wild grape seed and tree fruit seed, making him wonder what in the world is a tree fruit seed. He stood up, wondering if the tree grows from tree fruit, and thought he'd find out once he grows it, believing the forest would take care of the rest. Then, he asked himself if he should build a cabin next. The next day, in a certain dungeon, someone asked if they were sure the queen ant was there. The man just asked back, do you think I'd be crazy enough to enter the devil ant's dungeon? He told his companion they could earn a lot of money if they robbed the ant nest properly. Then the newbie stopped in confusion and mentioned, the quest has been cleared already, making the man pissed. He asked the newbie what he was talking about when the dungeon had just opened. But when they looked, they were all surprised to find the ant hive empty. The newbie asked if it could have been cleared in a different region, but the man just pissedly asked back, don't you know a cleared dungeon won't open for the second time? Then the man cursed because he couldn't believe it and decided to check it out for himself. The other man checked the ant hive, saying, he doesn't know who it was, but it seems like there was indeed an attack, and he doesn't see any live ants. The man shoutingly tells his companion to stop the nonsense and just find the traces of the ants because it's not possible that all of them are gone. Suddenly, the newbie panicky shouted for them to look at the ground, and the man confusedly looked down to check what it was. Then, they were all surprised to see a huge engraved palm beneath them. They all shook in fear while asking if it was the palm of a giant. Then the other man tells everyone that even if it was another monster, it should be at the level of destruction, making the man clench his teeth and uncontrollably shake in fear. Then the man ran away while shouting to his team to retreat. He asked them if they think they'd be able to fight and win against the monster that annihilated the devil ants and told them that if they are not careful, they too will be killed without even being able to do anything. Then the man ordered them that they should retreat first and contact the association, which they all replied that they understood and ran away as well. Later, the picture of the huge palm was sent to the association, and the man asked if it was discovered at the devil ant's nest. The secretary replied yes and explained to the man that they said it was already cleared. Oreo Group successor, Kim Hyung-suk, ordered the man to report to him if anything else came up, to which the man replied that he understood. Hyung-suk thought that the palm is not an ordinary monster and it's too big to be a new species either, which means it's a mythic grade monster that he doesn't know of, making him wonder if a monster above the destruction grade appears again. Hyung-suk noticed that strange things kept happening and seriously said that the terrible thing must not happen again. Meanwhile, in Seoul's area number 5, he was patiently waiting outside when someone called his name, making him look up. He saw a cheerful lady waving at him, asking if he had been waiting long. Then the lady told him he should have waited inside and apologized to him. He told her that he was okay and she shouldn't have to run because she might trip and fall. Then, as he expected, the lady tripped and fell. He helped her up and asked if she was okay. She told him not to worry because the book was safe, making him explain to her that it wasn't what he meant. The clumsy girl, he knows is Wang Sunyoung, South Korea's one and only origami hunter and an insane bookworm, which is how they got close. She tells him it's been a while since she worked out, so she forgot how to walk. He asked her if she had breakfast and gave her something, telling her that Jumi asked him to give it to her. She asked if he had waited to give it to her and thanked him for it. Then she gave him a book, making him confused. She explained that she went to the store last time, and the manager there was sad because people bought that book for decoration and were all asking for refunds. He asked if that was the reason she bought one, and she confidently replied that she thought it would fit his store's interior. He awkwardly laughed and said it was kind of scary that it was a book that was refunded continuously. Then he looked at the book when he felt something and was surprised to see that it was lighting up. The system showed him that he had acquired an infinite spell book and explained that to write a spell in the book, he needed thunderbird feathers and various ink. He asked Sunyoung if she was sure it was just for decoration and she replied she wasn't sure but there wasn't anything written in the book. She tried writing something on it but couldn't do it, so she thought that was why the manager said it was a decoration, making him realize why he got the message just now. Then he stared at her, guessing she didn't get the message. She apologized to him and said that if he didn't like it, she would take it back, but he told her that he actually liked it, making her happy. He asked if he really meant it, and he replied yes and that he would use it wisely. Later, back at his store, he tried to write something on it using an ordinary pen, but he couldn't write anything on it. He remembered that the system said he needed a Thunderbird's feather 
feather and various ink. He knew he could get information about the Thunderbird somehow, but it would be hard. Then the system popped up to show him that the Thunderbird is a colossal avian creature, very rare in various desolate terrains, excluding the oceans of the polar desert, with a wingspan of approximately 25 meters. He couldn't believe he had to hunt it to get the feather. He wondered how he was supposed to hunt that bird when it is rare, making him disappointedly think that he would end up using it as an actual decoration. But then the book lit up, and the system showed him that he had acquired a nice handwriting level in Ancient Magic Level 1. He couldn't believe he had new traits but didn't feel any different. Still, he knew that gaining that trait at this time couldn't be a coincidence, so he decided to try everything he could. Once again, he attempted to write in the book with a basic pen and this time, he successfully wrote in it, which increased his nice handwriting to level 2. After acquiring the nice handwriting trait, Gia experimented with a few different things and discovered two key facts about it. The first was that he couldn't write anything on the infinite spellbook even with the nice handwriting trait, and the second was that his handwriting became really pretty. He thought it was an amazing trait in a way because his handwriting had become pretty. Suddenly, he felt the place shake and heard a loud noise, leaving him stunned for a moment and wondering what it was. He cautiously walked outside, guessing something, and saw a gate opening in front of his store. Then the system showed that the dungeon difficulty category was rank O, the type was grassland and valley, the target was a thunderbird's feather, the time limit was one hour, and the entry restriction was labor, making him unable to believe it led straight to the thunderbird's place and wonder if the nice handwriting had affected something. Noticing the dungeon aura seemed dangerous, but thinking it should be fine since it was rank O, he decided to just go in and out. He walked inside the dungeon and was amazed by the place. He questioned if it was the Thunderbird's habitat because it didn't seem to fit a giant bird. Then he heard something behind him, turned around, and saw a Thunderbird above him. It flew up while he was panicking, marveling at how a bird could be so big and shouting that it was the size of a building. He wondered how he was supposed to hunt it, but then a feather floated down to him, and when he looked up, he saw the Thunderbird's feathers floating around him. He was relieved that he just had to pick up the feather on the ground and was amazed at how easy it was. Realizing now that all he needed was ink, he smiled, having thought of something. He went into the forest and met the General Pterodrones, who was holding green herb extract. He told it that finding the extract so quickly was fortunate and that it was a good thing he had asked it. He thanked it, making it shy. Now that the preparation was over, the last thing left was to solve the mystery of the infinite spellbook. He raised the feather pen he had made, wondering what kind of spell was in the infinite spellbook. Then he put the pen down to write in it, thinking he'd discover it himself. When he began to write, the letters he wrote in the infinite spellbook flew out of the book in shining yellow light and swirled around him. Then the letters flew down to the body of an old tree, and a few seconds later, he was surprised to see the letters engraved into the old tree in yellow light, realizing it was a rune word. He remembered that he once saw in an old book that a great tree taught an ancient tribe four spells, creation, harmony, change, and destruction. These spells were originally difficult to control, so the tribe discovered rune words through an expedient method as a solution. Then, he also recalled reading in the old book that the World Tree of the Beginning had taught them these magic spells. Ancient magic was difficult to use, so they created rune words to facilitate the usage of magic. However, he had never heard about rune words in his life, which made him wonder if someone was attempting to use them. The shock he experienced upon witnessing the rune words appear on the tree left him stunned in disbelief. He realized that rune words would emerge after fulfilling the conditions to use a spell book, but he wondered why they were engraved on the tree and not in the spell book. Then, he noticed that the tree with the words engraved on it was the tree branch he had planted when he first came to the dream forest. He had an idea of what was happening, but he thought there was no way the world tree could be that small. Then, he decided to write the rune words down because he did not know when they would disappear. While trying to write the rune words, he noticed that although it was his first time seeing them, he felt he understood their meaning, and he read that it signified destruction, thy flame will set everything on fire. A moment later, he finished writing all of them in the spell book, even though he thought the phrases were quite brutal. Then, the system showed him that he had obtained the scroll of change and destruction, which increased the destruction power of rune magic. This made him realize that writing rune words in the spell book would turn them into a scroll. Then, he tore the page, thinking that since it was a scroll, he should tear it. He rolled it and tied it with a ribbon, thinking it was quite cool. He planned to write more, but then a light appeared in the spell book, making him halt. He was surprised to see that the page was restored, proving that it was indeed an infinite spell book. He smiled, knowing he could keep writing in the book and that if he just had enough ink, he could write scrolls to his heart's content. However, he didn't know what the scroll effect was, as all it said was that it increased the destruction power of rune magic. Since he was not a magician, he couldn't try it out. 
but he knew he could check it if a magician used it. The next day, in Jia's store, Wei An asked him if he was the hunter Yu Jiha, and he confirmed that he was. She approached him swiftly, telling him that they had finally met. Slamming her hand on the counter, she angrily stated that he was very difficult to meet. Then, she asked him if he knew how many times she had come there just to meet him, causing him to panic. He apologized to her and explained that due to some personal circumstances, the shop was empty quite often. However, she just stared at him, thinking that he was the hunter named Yujiha, just as Cholhyun had said. He wondered why she was staring at him like that and if she was mad. She thought it was fine because her visit was not about Jia but about the items he sells. Clearing her throat, she took out a piece of paper, telling him that it was thoughtless of her since he must have had his circumstances. Then, she handed him her guild card and introduced herself as the Eternal Flame Guild Leader, Cha Wei'an. She mentioned that she heard he sells special items at his general store. He accepted the card and affirmed. As she was about to specify the special items she was referring to, he interrupted her, asking if she meant the solar apple potions or was looking for the winter strawberry potion. She confirmed that those were precisely what she was looking for and attempted to elaborate, but he laughed, informing her that those items were currently the most popular and asked her to wait a moment. He also mentioned that since she had visited several times to no avail, he'd like to offer her something on the house, leaving her surprised and questioning whether it was really so easy to obtain. Then, with a serious tone, he called her over and apologized because they were out of stock, stunning her with shock. He reflected on his complacency, attributing it to his distractions with the tarot drones and the infinite spellbook. Questioning his dedication as a general store owner, he acknowledged that this was the first time he had ever run out of stock. He then hopelessly informed Wei-An that if she returned the next day, he would prepare all the items she wished to purchase, apologizing once more. She remained silent, finding herself unable to speak because Jia appeared so regretful, leaving her to wonder if Jia was kind or naive. As she turned to leave, stating she had no choice but to return the next day due to the stock shortage, she expressed a quiet disappointment about not being able to use the items in the dungeon later. However, he stopped her to inquire if she was a flame magician, referencing her position as the guild leader of Eternal Flame. With a hint of dejection, she confirmed. He then declared it perfect and handed her the scroll. She questioned why he was giving her a scroll, and he explained that it was a flame attribute scroll he had created as a sample the previous day. He felt it wouldn't be right to let her leave empty-handed. As she opened the scroll, fire enveloped her while she read the phrase thy flame will set everything on fire. She expressed her appreciation for the phrase and left, promising to return the next day. He agreed and urged her to take care. As he watched her leave, he noticed the staff behind her shining leaving him to wonder if it had always shone like that. Later, in the spider dungeon, Wei-In informed her team that the sentinel spider had been defeated and ordered them to advance while maintaining their formation. Then, encountering a huge spider blocking their path, she used her flames to eliminate it and loudly told her team that they should penetrate the center in a similar fashion, urging them to prepare for the push. As she ran, she found it odd that her powers felt stronger than usual, making her question if it was just her imagination. However, she also noticed that the rune stone in her staff was behaving erratically. Suddenly, she heard someone urgently calling out to her, warning her to watch out. Fortunately, she jumped backward in time to avoid poison that were about to fall on her. She confirmed her well-being when the man asked if she was okay. Observing that there were more spiders than reported, she questioned the accuracy of their intel while gazing at the swarm of eyes fixed on them. The man apologized, explaining the unpredictable nature of the forest-type dungeon. He then suggested a retreat to reorganize, but she refused determined to continue regardless of the circumstances. Despite the man's caution against overexertion, she unleashed her fire, reassuring him not to worry as she felt unusually capable in her current state. Positioning her staff forward, she warned her team to stand back unless they wished to be engulfed by her attack. She then produced a powerful flame that incinerated the spiders to ashes. Her team was astounded by her strength, questioning the extent of her skill's advancement. They remarked that with her power, she could potentially clear the entire dungeon single-handedly. She herself was taken aback by her formidable power, pondering if the scroll Jia had given her was the source of this enhancement. The next day, in Jia's store, he placed a box of potions on the table, wiping his sweat as he questioned if it was sufficient. After finishing the preparation of the solar apple potions and winter strawberry potions, he glanced at the clock, realizing that all that remained was to package them before Wei-In's arrival. Recalling her mention of coming early in the morning, he decided to expedite the process. Then, as the store door opened, triggering the doorbell, he turned to greet Wei-In, informing her that he was in the midst of packing the potions she had requested the day before. However, noticing her solitary presence, he inquired if the man accompanying her was a guild member. She deferred the conversation about the potions to a later time, suggesting they have a talk first, which puzzled him. Once seated, a suitcase filled with money was laid before him 
prompting him to question its purpose. Wei-in responded that it was indeed money, then probed whether he was the type who does not obsess over wealth, concluding that his reasonable potion pricing must have a rationale. He admitted his fondness for money but explained his astonishment at the sudden large sum presented to him. Wei-in revealed that the scroll he had given her the previous day possessed tremendous effects, warranting a grade of or possibly beyond S, and expressed her discomfort at acquiring such a high-value scroll for free. He understood her point, acknowledging he had anticipated such a reaction given the infinite spellbook's excellence. She suggested if Cash was uncomfortable for him, she could transfer the amount, asking him to indicate his preference. He expressed his gratitude but maintained that accepting the money was beyond his principles, leaving her perplexed. He then reminded her that, as previously stated, the scroll was an apology for the inconvenience caused by the weight, asserting he was not honorable enough to accept the money, knowing the scroll's effectiveness was still unproven. She questioned if he realized the thin line between being virtuous and foolish, surprising Chulhyun with her abrupt call, but continued to press the issue of the potential consequences if valuable resources were given away freely. He countered, asking if such actions would create a world where wealth was ubiquitous, to which she angrily retorted that it would not. She warned that public knowledge of his actions could make him a target for many, leaning in to emphasize the significance yet peril of his abilities in the hunter's world. Upon asking if he grasped the gravity of her words, he slightly jumped, intimidated, and acknowledged her concern. Then she explained to him that the reason she brought the cash herself was to prove that their guild could reward him appropriately for his abilities too. She asked him if Eternal Flame was the large guild known for its good welfare, and told him that she didn't have to go that far to prove herself. Smilingly, she told him that she wanted to show him that such a famous and good guild is very favorable toward him. Then she explained to him that there are generally many magicians in Eternal Flame, but there are quite a few alchemists too. Then she introduces Cholhyun to him as their chief alchemist, and Cholhyun, without choice, tells him that he loves Eternal Flame. Then she tells him that there are also many other skilled alchemists like Cholhyun there, so he'll have a lot of chances to research together. Also, the salary and allowances will be tailored to his wishes as much as possible, and she can give him the authority to be a chief or higher, making him sweat under pressure. She was about to invite him to join them, but he cut her off by thanking her for saying all of it, but he told her that he'd just accept the gesture. She brightly tells Cholhyun to prepare the contract in a hurry, but then she realizes that Jia said he'll just accept the gesture. She shoutingly asks him why and if isn't what she said already such a generous term. He replied that just like she said, it was too much for him, so he thought it'll be better for people better than him to join, making her fume in anger and shoutingly tell him that he was more than capable and he should stop putting himself down like that while Cholhyun is trying to calm her down. She stops when he tells her that he was originally the lowest rank hunter, with no attributes, and the fact that he could make those special items was not because of his abilities, but due to a situation of luck and an amazing friend, so he knows that his abilities may disappear someday and it was why he has no confidence in doing great things with that ability. He also tells her that he was too attached to his store to leave it. She tried to disagree, but Cholhyun tells her that it seemed like it would be difficult to change Jiha's mind and they should stop and respect Jiha's wishes. He tells her that he won't forget her advice and will be careful, so he is going to charge a bit more for the potions she reserved yesterday. She tells him that anyone would think she was making him do bad things and that she feels uncomfortable because it feels like she got dumped but she has no other choice. Then she warned him that in return, he shouldn't regret it if he fell into a dangerous situation later. He tells her not to worry because if a dangerous situation arises, the device next to him will let him know first, pointing at the humming bell at his side that can make a sound when a worker is in danger. Ever since the gates appeared, spending a daily life with nature disappeared because both the sea and the beach had been taken over by monsters, and it was hard to find a place without them, even in a mountain or a valley. But in the dream forest, he could enjoy the beautiful scenery. When he arrived at the forest beach, he felt such relief and thought the sea was the best remedy for his headaches. Walking around, he realized that there was not only a forest in the dream forest but also a sea, making him wonder if that place was more like a paradise on earth. He decided to focus on the general store rather than the dream forest for the time being, but he had been exhausted since early in the morning, making him wonder if he was disqualified from being a general store owner. He exclaimed that general store or not, he was going to heal himself by evening there, eat a lot, and read a lot of books too. Exhausted from interacting with people that day, Jia spent some alone time in the dream forest. However, he overlooked the fact that anytime and anywhere, unexpected guests could arrive while he was looking at the shining white animal sleeping on his leg. 
Two hours ago, he was engrossed in a book in front of the bonfire he had made, feeling the calmness of his surroundings. He reflected on how, in the past, listening to the sound of waves wouldn't have been so difficult. However, the current seas are no longer safe for humans, so he recognized it as great luck that he was able to face the sea and listen to the sound of the waves like this. He thought that if he had the chance later, he'd like to bring Sungho or Sunny on. Suddenly, he heard something nearby and, upon listening carefully, realized it was the sound of a cat coming from inside the cave next to him. He grabbed his torch and bag to investigate, noting that the sound was similar to that of a kitten, but subtly different, as if it also resembled the sound of a wild beast like a lion or tiger. He glanced at the humming bell and saw that it was quiet, indicating no danger. Suddenly, he noticed the general terror drone flying above him at full speed. He followed it and noticed that the sound was drawing closer to where they were heading. Then he saw the creature making the sound lying on the ground. The system identified it as an actus, making him wonder what actus meant, but he knew it was too big to be called a cat. He carefully picked it up, noting its poor condition, and wondered if it would be alright to feed it a potion. The pterodrone general nudged him to get his attention. He apologized to it, explaining he was so distracted by the actus that he had forgotten about them, but was surprised to see they were holding fish. He asked the pterodrone general if they were taking care of the actus's food, to which it nodded. He patted it, expressing his pride and promising to bring a lot of delicious food the next time he came to the forest. Back to the present, after the Actus ate the fishes and drank the solar apple potion, it peacefully slept on his lap, making him relieved that it had taken the potion well. Although it had been shivering until recently, it seemed fine now based on how well it was sleeping. Curious, as it was his first time seeing animals there despite not having explored the entire dream forest, he patted its head and asked where it came from. The Actus woke up at his touch, and he immediately apologized, asking if his touch had awakened it. But it simply meowed sweetly at him and stretched on his leg, winning his heart with its cuteness. He lifted it, asking if it was acting cute on purpose and if this was the being chosen thing he had only heard about. Then, he pondered what to call it, deciding that Actus didn't sound cute. Since it resembled a tiger, he thought Bam, which means tiger in Korean, sounded good. He also told it that if it had nowhere to go, it should come with him to which it meowed in agreement. The next day, a customer was enchanted by Bayam's cuteness and asked him if Bayam wasn't a snow leopard, and where he had found it. He replied that he had encountered it in a dungeon and brought it home since it seemed to have nowhere else to go, and its name was Bayam. The lady asked if she might pet Bayam, to which he agreed. However, as the lady was about to pet Bayam, it became aggressive and swatted at the lady's hand. He panicked and asked the lady if she was alright. She replied that her hand was fine, but her heart was hurt. He apologized to the lady and explained that Bam was a bit shy. Then he told Bam that it must not behave like that, realizing that Bam was only kind to him and rather prickly towards anyone else. He thought that if Bam was shy, keeping it in the store might not be a good idea. Yet, he also knew he couldn't just leave it alone at his home, and he wanted to share Bam's cuteness too. Then Hyogen walked into the store. He warmly welcomed her, noting it had been a long time since their last meeting. She mentioned she had some business nearby, so she stopped by for a bit and offered him some coffee, but then she saw Bam lying on the table. Hyogen fearfully hid behind a coat rack stand and asked him what it was while pointing at Bam. He replied that it was Bam, a tiger, noting that Hyogen seemed scared too. She fearfully handed him the coffee and he asked if it was for him. But she jumped back, telling him the wild beast was getting closer to her. He apologized, explaining he hadn't realized she would be so scared of it and mentioned that it would be living with him from now on. He was about to pick up Bam, but its tail wagged, surprising him. Then he told Hyogen that Bam seemed to be asking for her to pet it, which confused her. Nevertheless, she hesitantly raised her hand and patted Bam, who accepted her touch. She remarked on how soft and gentle Bam was, but he laughingly said it was a tiger only in name. Then she mentioned she had heard he was giving out buff scrolls for free, causing a bit of an uproar on Hunter Net. He confirmed that even the guild leader of Eternal Flame Guild had visited recently. She couldn't believe he had given way in a scroll worth hundreds of millions, making her wonder if Jia was unambitious or just dull. She mused that Jia had always lived uncalculatedly, without greed, and made others feel comfortable, which made her question if that was why she often visited the store. Suddenly, the humming bell rang loudly, leaving him confused and wondering what was up with the humming bell. Then they heard a warning that a Type 4 catastrophe was imminent and residents nearby should evacuate immediately. The announcement clarified that it was not a drill and urged immediate evacuation. Hyogen shouted at him to evacuate at once and hurry, leaving him stunned in surprise. A moment later, when everyone was out of their houses, the army positioned their tanks around the affected area. Then, another army assisted the people to a safe place. While walking, he realized that if it were a Type 4 warning, they must be facing the catastrophe of a Category 4 dungeon. If that were the case, there would likely be many strong hunters, which gave him hope that the hunters could stop it. 
Bayam hid in fear against his chest, and he assured it that everything would be fine and nothing would happen. But then, they heard a loud opening sound and felt the ground shake violently. The people around him cried, panicked, and shouted in fear. He wondered if it was still too early for him to feel reassured. Bayam meowed sadly at him and looked up tearfully. He patted its head and assured it that everything was fine and it was probably nothing. A catastrophe arises when hunters entering a dungeon fail to complete their quest. There won't be any major problem with the catastrophe of a low difficulty dungeon. But it was a different story when a dungeon of rank 4 or higher suffered a catastrophe. In the event of a catastrophe, civilians within a radius of 20 kilometers of the gate are to be evacuated, while simultaneously carrying out military operations and deploying armored forces. Then, high-ranking hunters are mobilized. Hyogen tells everyone that the enemy is coming. Then, the undead emerge from the dungeon. The military general ordered his men to open fire, which the armies did, shooting the undead coming out of the dungeon. The jet took off, holding missiles, and released them onto the undead on the ground, causing a loud explosion. On the other hand, Hyungsuk, watching from the side, guessed that the undead dungeon attack must have failed. However, he thought that with such firepower, it would end soon. Knowing he would have to escape after finishing off the remnants, he ordered the general army to focus their firepower on the gate and informed them that they would deal with the monsters that escaped and the curse using liches. The general replied that he understood. Hyunsuk thought they would be able to end it if there were no other variables. But then, a huge hand grabbed the gate from inside, and a gigantic being slowly emerged, shocking Hyunsuk in horror. He immediately ordered the general to focus their firepower on the huge monstrous being urgently, to which the general replied that he understood. The general then ordered his men to open fire and unleash everything they had on the huge monster, which the army did, attacking the huge monster with all their might. One of the missiles flew into the huge monster's mouth and exploded loudly. The army believed their attack was taking effect, but Hyungsuk knew the monstrous being was of disaster rank, which meant that many attacks wouldn't even leave a scratch on it. The monster declared them enemies, dangerous enemies, so he must kill them. Then, it charged toward them while shouting about the dangerous enemy. Hyungsuk cursed and ordered everyone to dodge, but the creature just passed by them, making him wonder if it was not attacking them. He looks back and realizes that the monster's target is the shelter. Someone jumps from the shelter's roof, and Hyogen flies down toward it with her blades, questioning, who said you could go to the shelter? Then, she unleashes her powerful sword rampage skill, slashing it hundreds of times in just a few seconds. Wei Yin shouts to everyone to stand back as she swings her staff, attacking the monster with her strong flame. But when the smoke from their attack clears, they are surprised to see that it isn't even turning back. Then, it raises its huge fist and punches the shelter, breaking it apart and causing a loud sound. Hyogen runs toward it to attack again, and Wei-In warns her that getting close is dangerous. But Hyogen asks if Wei-In is suggesting they just watch the people die. She reminds Wei-In that Jia and the others are inside the shelter. When the huge monster makes a large entry to enter the shelter, it glares at Jia, declaring it has found him and calling him their enemy. Jia panics, realizing the shelter has been breached, and wonders if the situation outside is dire. He knows he must run, but his legs won't move. Begging his shaking legs to move, he finally manages, only to fall to the ground in horror when the monster tries to grab him. Bayam exhales air and roars at the monster, causing the monster to stop. Then, Bayam gets out of his arms and releases a strong light, confusing him. Bayam calls the monster a lowly demon, making it sweat in fear and ordering it to get lost. This reveals Bayam's true power and appearance to the monster. Hyogen, running closer to the shelter, feels an enormous amount of ether but thinks whatever it is, it's their chance while the monster is frozen. Then, she calls to Wei-In for a flame. Wei-In imbues her sword with flames, telling her, I knew it even without you saying it. Then, she swings her sword at the monster, attacking it with the fire sword rampant, a combination of her sword rampage and Wei-In's flame. The monster is burned inside and out by the slashes, and Hyogen safely lands on the ground, exhausted. Wei-In asks if it is over, but Hyogen replies not yet, explaining that she felt an enormous amount of ether inside the shelter. Then, they enter the shelter, and Hyogen sees him picking up Bayam from the ground. He doesn't answer her because he is focused on Bam, who is releasing Etha. After the fight, ambulances arrive to take care of the wounded, while Hyogen looks around, no longer sensing the Etha. Meanwhile, in Jia's house, he pats Bam, now calm, pondering over the day's events. As he dries his hair, he reflects on the craziness of the day. Bam, jumping into his lap, affectionately scratches its head against him. He praises Bam for the impressive work done, noting its anger at the monstrous being. But now it appears relaxed. 
Contemplating the encounter, he decides to document it in the Infinite Spellbook, unaware his words are being transferred to the Mir Wiki. In the office, Hyung Suk is surprised to discover that the Mir Wiki has updated with details of the monstrous being. 15 meters tall, ugly, with formidable strength. He is taken aback that the Mir Wiki, supposedly uneditable by anyone, has new information. In the meeting room, a report comes in about an Aether Wave, leading to the consensus that their hunters didn't defeat the monstrous being. Another voice adds that the damage could have been far greater if not for the Aether Explosion. The conversation turns to speculation about the cause. One suggests it's too soon to attribute the event to a human, proposing it might have been a natural phenomenon. Hyung Suk listens in silence until someone urgently inquires if everyone at the shelter felt the Aether Explosion. The response highlights the shelter was filled with civilians, emphasizing the need to control the situation and identify the source. Hyogen exchanges looks with Hyung Suk as someone mentions the Mir Wiki update, signaling that something more significant is underway, marking the first time the Mir Wiki has been updated. The briefing continues, revealing that someone possesses enough strength to intimidate the monstrous being, and this new information has been added to the Mir Wiki. Hume Suck and Wei in glance at Hyogen when she points out two possibilities. The individual who repelled the monstrous being was either at the shelter or possesses a unique ability unlike any hunter. Wei in then raises the point that many reported hearing a cat's cry coinciding with the Aether explosion. Hume Suck initially dismisses the detail as irrelevant. But Wei Yin insists, mentioning the presence of a store owner and a cat resembling a snow leopard at the shelter, silencing the room in surprise. The next day, as the store's doorbell rings, Jia greets the customer, shocked to see Hyogen, Wei Yin, and Hyung Suk enter. They approach him, causing his anxiety to spike, questioning their intentions. They forcefully place their hands on the counter, demanding to see his cat. Raising his hands in a gesture of peace, he inquires if they mean Bam, cautioning them that Bam might get scared and run. Yet, their attention shifts downwards at the sound of rustling by his side, where he then sees Bam attempting to reach the counter. Then, Bam jumps onto the counter and yawns as he stretches. They all seriously look at Bam, making him glance back at them in confusion. But then, Wei-In lifts Bam, asking if it was the cat that caused the Aether Wave, and tells them that Bam just looks like a normal cat. Panicky, he warns her that she can't hold Bam like that but she dismissively tells them she doesn't sense any ether from Bam. She argues she should sense something if that little cat caused such a massive explosion, while Bam tries to free itself from her arms. Then, Bam bites Wei In's arm when she doesn't let go and jumps back to the counter, leaving her in pain. He, smilingly, tells Wei In that Bam bites, so she should be careful. Hyogen tells him that she heard he was at the shelter during the monstrous being incident, and there was a report that said someone heard a cat noise right before the monstrous being ran away, making him sweat in panic. Hyung Suk agrees with Hyogen, but when Bam tries to grab his head, Hyung Suk tells everyone that he thinks it is a false report. Then, Hyung Suk looks at Wei In, wishing he could scout Jiha right now, but he knew that now was not a good time. He didn't want to compete against the Eternal Flame Guild, which had already been rejected by Jiha, and was busy fighting with Bam. Then, Hyung Suk turns around to leave and tells Jiha that he'll see him again next time. Wei In asks Hyung Suk if he is leaving and tells him she wanted to see him get rejected like her, while Hyogen is looking at Jiha. Hyogen opens her mouth and smilingly tells him that she'd be back, to which he happily responds that she is welcome anytime. Later, he enters the dream forest and reads a book about the Jahanna continent. He looks at the map in the book, remembering that he heard about it from somewhere. Then, he reads in the book that in the Jahanna continent, many races live together with the Great Tree, which created the nature gods to protect Jahanna. He is confused about what it means and reads that it had white fur with black spots and nature's raging fangs. After reading it, he looks in front of him, realizes something, and wonders if Bam is a nature god. He thinks that Tiny Cat doesn't look like one of the gods, but considering what happened around him, it makes sense. He puts down the book, knowing that it wasn't a coincidence, and remembers that they said there was a big Aether explosion, making him think that it must have been Bam who did it. This means he can say that Bam is a nature god, making him wonder if the tree in his dream could possibly be the nature great tree. After figuring it out, everything makes sense to him now. He feels like the tree is giving him a job, and it all starts with getting into the laborer class, helping the Terra drones, and saving Bam making him feel that everything is part of the great plan. Suddenly, the book beside him lights up and opens on its own, making him surprised. Then it shows that his class has changed to XXX's worker, his health has increased to 90, his essence becomes 2, his traits are XXX's blessing, and his skills are plant amiability level 1, animal amiability level 1, and alchemy level 2. 
He wonders what XXX's worker means, but then the book beside him lights up even more, making him cover his eyes. Well guys, that's the end of the video. If you like this video comment part 2 in the comment section. Also subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell and like the video. Thank you for watching and see you next time again.